أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب القلوبنا وشافع أنفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وأهل أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين May the peace and blessings of Allah Azzawajal be upon Fatima and her father and her husband and her children. Dear viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam and any viewers who may be tuning in from a non-Muslim background, I welcome you back to this episode of your show from the laws of Zahra alayhi salam. From the Laws of Zahra السلام, is obviously a title which is selected due to the name of a book published by one of the greatest ulama of the 20th century who passed away in the year 2001, namely the great Marja Taqlid Al-Imam Muhammad al husseini Shirazi. Whilst we have not as of yet entered into the substance of the book and inshallah ta'ala within the next few halaqat we will be leading shortly up towards the introduction of the great scholar Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi in his work Min Fiqh al-Zahra as it is originally entitled in the Arabic language we have managed to introduce several important discussions and preliminary introductions which are necessary for us to understand the great need and necessity of studying and indeed having such a book such as Min Fiqh al-Zahra published, explained and available in public within the English language. One of the very crucial important details of such a work is that it brings us to an understanding of what the religion of Islam is all about and also helps us to crush several of the misconceptions that are present amongst the non-Muslim world or indeed should I say within non-Muslim mindsets for indeed you have some Muslims you have some non-Muslims living within the Muslim world itself who misunderstand the religion of Islam and indeed it helps bring the Muslims be they of whatever strand they might be out there back to a key and core understanding of what the basic foundational teachings of the message of Islam are. As was mentioned in the first halaqa or the first episode of this series, we discussed the great life of the writer and scholar and master of the Islamic sciences, the great Mujahid, Muhammad al husseini al-Shirazi, rahmatullah alayhi, and we discussed how he wished to make clear, how he wished to announce to the non-Muslim world and before it even the Islamic world that the religion of Islam is a religion which is in line with human nature. It is a religion which wishes to bring the human being out from the slavery of idolatry, be that idol worship of the self, money or any of the other deviant corrupt ideologies which mankind has shaped in order to justify his wretched lifestyle or even some of the noble intended ideas and methodologies and ideologies which people have shaped in order to attempt to break the nasty cycle of human suffering. Imam Muhammad al-Shirazi rahmatullah alayhi was of the opinion that Islam is a complete way of life and that Islam has the keys to all problems within the human world and indeed the world at large including the rights of animals, the rights of the environment and all such things. One of the great works which he wrote was the work Min Fiqh Zahra. In the previous episodes I have discussed why it is necessary for us to engage in this historical discussion why it is necessary for us to engage in a discussion pertaining to something which is somewhat of a sore spot for some of the Muslims 
because it deals with an issue of history which has become contentious between both the Sunni and Shia Muslims. And we find that there are disagreements in regards to this reading, interpretation and details of such historical events. More importantly, we find that in a world today which is surrounded and filled with people committing terrorist acts, acts of violence, acts of oppression, leading people into suffering under the name of the religion of Islam, it is particularly of the utmost importance to clarify what the foundational and core message of Islam was and is. And it brings me back to the question which I've raised in the past two or three episodes, namely, did Allah Azza wa Jal, when he gave us the religion of Islam, we as Muslims all submit that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa was the final messenger given to humanity. When he gave us that final messenger, did guidance cease there? We know, according to Islamic theology and according to history itself, that the previous revealed religions, the previous reve previously revealed covenants were to some degree perverted, distorted, and the followers of the original messengers of Allah Azza wa were taken out of the light and into darkness by corrupt hypocrites and evil-minded people who sought to corrupt these religions. That is not to say that we are talking about any religion in particular, but for those who are familiar with the fact that we have a plethora of world religions today, the logical principle of non-contradiction, namely that something cannot be true and false at the same time, dictates that some of these religions are false and that some of them are either true Allow me to rephrase that. Either one of these religions is true or all of them are false. And if they are all false, then they all contradict each other. And if one of them is true, then it contradicts some of the other religions. This is not to offend some religious groups. This is merely what logic dictates of us to understand. The question we raised was the question, did Allah Azza wa Jal, through the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa leave us with a self-preservation mechanism? I don't wish to repeat the entire discussion which occurred on the previous episodes of this show. However, to summarize, what we would say is that Allah Azza wa Jal, through the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa did indeed give us self-preservation mechanisms in order to determine what is correctly Islamic and what is un-Islamic. We listed some of these things. One of the things that was done was the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa giving us the hadith of Thaqalain, when he said that I am leaving behind two weighty things, the book of Allah and my progeny, my Ahlul Bayt, and these two things shall never separate, showing us and highlighting that there are a party of individuals who are known as the Ahlul Bayt, who are somehow related to the prophets, and indeed these individuals contain and hold the same attributes that we Muslims attribute to the Quran itself namely guidance, uncorruptibility, and a light for all Muslims. Now, I don't wish to go into who are the Ahlul Bayt, for indeed, it is well known who I believe the Ahlul Bayt are, alayhi salam, namely they are the 14 Ma'asumeen, the Holy Prophet, his daughter Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi salam, and the 12 Imams who we believe in, starting from Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and coming all the way down to our occulted Imam, whom we pray Allah will hasten the reappearance of, namely al hujja ibn al-Hassan al-Mahdi. However, coming back to the real crux of the discussion, we came on to the personality of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, who was one of the self-preservation mechanisms left by the Holy Prophet to preserve and keep the religion intact in case of corrupt plots which would occur in order to usurp the very reins of the religion of Islam. And we have stated that this has happened, inshallah ta'ala, within the next few episodes we will discuss how this happened. But how did the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala emphasize that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam was somehow a means we could rely upon in order to ensure that Islam would be preserved with her? For some people might come forward and say, yes, she is the Prophet's daughter, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and peace be upon her. However, 
How do we know that just because she is the Prophet's daughter, she holds a sacred status in the religion of Islam? They might come forward and tell you, in the Quran, you have the son of Nuh. And we seek Allah, we seek refuge with Allah from the accursed whisperings of such an analogy. However, it is fair for them to ask this question. We have already said that an agreed upon tradition between the Muslims is the tradition, Fatima is a part of me, as was stated by the Holy Prophet. He goes on further to state, whoever offends her, whoever hurts her, whoever angers her, whoever disturbs her, has angered, offended, disturbed, and hurt myself. And we came to the conclusion that logically, because he did not restrict the statement to only certain means of angering her, or in certain occasions, that he must mean in general, in entirety, whoever angers her has angered him. And we've stated that such a person who is anger, who, whose anger angers Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, whom we know that Allah is angered by his anger, must be infallible. We went through some of the narrations and merits of the Holy Lady of Islam, Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, and we mentioned how there was an attempt to distort some of these narrations and attribute them to other people. For example, this great tradition, this tradition which states, Fatima is a part of me, whoever angers her has also angered me, coming from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, we find that they attribute this statement to Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra being angered by Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam and we seek refuge from the shaitanic whisperings which might lead any of us to believe that. For indeed it is proven to us through clear cut textual evidence that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was likewise infallible and hence could never be someone who angered Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra. We stated that such attempts to cast doubt upon the Ahlul Bayt were one of the only methods through which such a statement could be preserved. For, for we find immediately after the death of the Prophet there was an attempt to ban the narrations of the Prophet to, to censor them. Somewhat of a state censorship on narrating traditions somehow we could link this to a dictatorship's attempt to prevent news from being spread, accurate news. And indeed we found that books were burnt for merely carrying narrations of the Holy Prophet Within this time, there was a great conspiracy to deny the rights of the Ahlul Bayt through being spread. Now, I don't wish to restrict this as having occurred within a particular time frame, but all Muslims, be they Sunni or Shia, agree that there was indeed a malicious attempt to prevent the merits of the Ahlul Bayt from being spread. And we gave some examples of how occasionally these things are done. Coming back to the example we gave before the end of the last episode where we cut short and were unable to continue. We mentioned that the narration which is found within the vast majority of Sunni works is as follows. Narrated from Ibn Abbas. The Messenger of Allah drew four lines on the ground and then said, do you know what this is? They replied, Allah and his Messenger know best. Then the Messenger of Allah said, The greatest of all women of paradise are Bibi Khadija, namely Sayyidah Khadija, the mother of Fatima. Sayyidah Fatima, the daughter of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidah Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, and Maryam, the daughter of Imran. Of course, all being great women within the religion of Islam. Join me after the short break, inshallah ta'ala, in which we will come back to how this tradition has been distorted in some works. Grand Ayatollah Muhammad Shirazi was the religious authority merge to millions of Shia Muslims around the globe. A charismatic leader who is known for his high moral values, modesty, and spirituality. He is a mentor and source of aspiration to the millions and the means of access to authentic knowledge and teachings of Islam. 
He has made extensive contributions in fields of learning ranging from jurisprudence and theology to politics, economics, law, and sociology. Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi was born in the holy city of Najaf, Iraq, in 1374 after Hijra, 1927 AD. He belongs to a distinguished family deeply rooted in Islamic science, literature, and virtue. His followers are found in many countries in the global. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi was distinguished for his intellectual ability and holistic vision. He was recognized for his clear ideas and realistic solutions to issues of concern to mankind. He has written various specialized studies that are concerned to be among the most important references in the Islamic sciences of beliefs and doctrine, ethics, politics, economics, sociology, law, human rights, etc. He has enriched the world with his staggering contributions of some 1300 books, treaties, and studies on various branches of learning. His works range from simple introductory books for the young generations to literary and scientific masterpieces. Deeply rooted in the Holy Quran and the teachings of the Prophet of Islam, his visions and theories covers areas as politics, economics, government, management, sociology, theology, philosophy, history, and Islamic law. His work on Islamic jurisprudence, for example, contributes 150 volumes which run into more than 55,000 pages. Through his original thoughts and ideas, he has championed the causes of issues such as the family, human rights, freedom of expression, political pluralism, non-violence, and shura or consultative system of leadership. Grand Ayatollah Shirazi believes in the fundamental and elementary nature of freedom in mankind. He calls for freedom of expressions, political plurality, debate and discussion, tolerance and forgiveness. He strongly believes in the consultative system of leadership and calls for the establishment of the leadership council of religious authorities. He calls for the establishment of the universal Islamic government to encompass all the Muslim countries. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Dear viewers, thank you for enduring patiently with that short break. Prior to the break, we were recording, or recalling rather, a tradition which is fairly widespread within the books of the Ahl al-Sunnah wal jamaah in which one of the key merits of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is mentioned. We mentioned that within this key tradition, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had informed his companions that from amongst the four chief ladies of paradise, we have Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam, the mother of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. We have Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, and indeed we have two other women who were mentioned and praised in the Holy Quran, namely Asiya, the wife of Pharaoh, and Maryam, the daughter of Imran and the mother of Isa alayhi salam. Some might wonder how such a tradition could be distorted. Is it merely a distortion of adding a name to it? Or how would they distort it? Would they remove the name of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? Allow us to investigate and witness how the traditions of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi have been tampered with in order to suit the agenda of people who wish to demean the Ahlul Bayt and raise the status of their opponents. We find it is mentioned in Al-Bukhari's book, As-Sahih, that is narrated by Abi Musa al-Ash'ari, who states the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said, Many men reached the level of perfection, but no woman reached such a level except Sayyidah Maryam, daughter of Imran, Sayyidah Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. Then he goes on to say, and the superiority of Aisha, the wife of the Holy Prophet, is like the superiority of Tharid, which is of course an Arab dish in which bread is soaked up in 
the cooked water of a dish to other meals. We find that such tradi tradition in its origin with exactly the same chain of transmission is narrated in the work of a tabari, namely a tabari's tafsir. And within that tradition, we find that the tradition reads as such. The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, has said, many men reached the level of perfection, but no woman reached such a level except Sayyidah Maryam, alayhi salam, Sayyidah Asiya, alayhi salam, Khadija, alayhi salam, and Sayyidah Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa One has to ask, how is it that tr the traditionists who were familiar and unlike us today, were memorizers of thousands, hundreds of thousands of traditions narrated from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, would not be able to distinguish between that tradition and the clumsily fabricated one in which we have the, not only the name of Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam removed but we have the name of Khadija alayhi salam the mother of Sayyidah Fatima to Zahra and an important member of the Prophet's household removed from the tradition. We find that such actions, such games were played with the Prophet's traditions, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, in order to confuse the Muslims, in order to detract from the status of the real possessors of authority, the real possessors of merits, and to give these merits to people who did not deserve them. Now I understand that my words here may seem hurtful, they may seem harmful, to some people who can understand the implications of what I am saying here. And indeed, just to remind all viewers, it is not my intention to be offensive. It is not my intention to demean anyone. However, the Ahlul Bayt السلام, are a people who cannot be compared to anyone else. And just because someone is righteous does not mean they should be considered amongst the foremost righteous people. Likewise, when we look at the tradition itself, which has been fabricated, where it states that very few women have reached perfection, aside from Maryam and Asiya, and that the superiority of Aisha over other women is like the superiority of this Arab dish, Tharid, over other meals. This is a strange tradition. It's a tradition which very few of us can come to understand. Why is it that Tharid has been highlighted as a particularly special dish? More importantly, when we look at the Prophet's traditions, we find that often the well-known established ones make sense. He says things like, O oh Ali, salam, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. Or for example, he might make the comparison of someone else. In another tradition we have within our books, he compares Ali salam, to Yushua, the successor of Musa. Never before have I come across such a tradition in which the Holy Prophet subjectively compares a woman to a dish which can only be described as being subjectively favored by certain people. I'm sure there's many people out there in the world who don't even like Tharid. And of course, in the previous episode, I did mention I'm from amongst them. I don't know if that's as a result of this tradition or not. But indeed, that's a separate topic. More importantly, when we come to look at how it is we should be analyzing traditions, not only according to the classical methods of analyzing the train of transmission, but according to other methods in which we are given a particular key to understand traditions. What do I mean by this? As we will see when we come to enter the discussion of the work of Imam Muhammad al-Husseini al-Shirazi rahmatullah alayhi, in his work from the laws of Zahra, 
we will see that one of the things Sayyidah Fatima Zahra alayhi salam highlighted in her khutbah, in her sermon, in which she rebuked the oppressors, was the fact that if a tradition is in contradiction to the narrations, if a tradition is in contradiction to the verses of the Holy Quran, then we must throw that tradition against the wall. So allow us to ask, Quranically, is there any justification for the fabrication of this rawaya in which we are told that very few women have reached perfection and they are Asiya, Maryam, and particularly Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa I'm sure we would all agree that in order for someone to reach perfection, nothing should have been in their path which could serve as an obstacle. Very few of us would claim perfection for ourselves even by the end of our lives. And very few of us who have made major mistakes in our lives could ever claim perfection ever within this limited world. In fact, I don't believe we claim perfection for anyone who is known to make mistakes. We find Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Tahrim, Surah number 66 of the Holy Quran, He states, Allah sets forth an example for those who disbelieve. The wife of Noah and the wife of Lut, they were under two of our righteous servants, but they both betrayed them. And so they availed them not against Allah and it is said, enter the fire along with those who enter. This is found in Surah 66, Surah Tahrim, Ayah 10. The question here which must be asked is, who did Allah Azza reveal this ayah upon? All the mufassireen, all the exegetes, all the commentators of the Holy Quran have agreed upon this fact be they Sunni or Shia. They agree upon the fact that this ayah was revealed upon the personality of two of the wives of the Prophet, Aisha and Hafsa, to such a degree that according to narrations found from Amr ibn Khattab, the second ruler of the Saqifah government in Sahih Muslim and an authority for all Sunni Muslims, we are told that had it not been for his intervention, according to this narration, the Prophet would have divorced Hafsa, and no doubt, given that she shared in the same degree of crime with her partner Aisha, he would have divorced her too. Now we need to ask the question, how is it that someone who the Prophet was close to divorcing, and indeed Allah threatens in the Holy Quran, with a defense of all the angels, something he's never threatened in any other case, in history, in the Quran, in all the battles, we were given a specific number, 70,000, thousands. We were never given the entirety of angels as being given as a force against a party. This woman is described as someone who all the angels will back Rasulullah up against, can be compared to the best of women of paradise. Now, that is not for me to offend anyone, and indeed my intention has not been to offend anyone tonight. But I wish that the Muslims would open their minds, open their hearts, and accept that the Holy Prophet ﷺ has given a special status to Fatima. And that status is something which we can never remove from her, nor can we accept fabricated traditions which attempt to remove that status from her. Inshallah ta'ala, within the next episode of the show, as we have run out of time, we will be discussing how Fatima Tazara played a major part in the self-preservation of Islam in a time in which the religion entered a crisis and was doomed to become obliterated. A time in which many people turned their backs on the religion of Islam, those who were from the companions of the Holy Prophet And I pray that you will join me for that show. Thank you all for tuning into this show. And please do not forget us in your du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.